Let us pray in preparation for the preaching of His Word. Lord God, help us turn our hearts to You and hear what You will speak. For You speak peace to Your people. Amen. I hand the time over to Agnes. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Now, have you ever seen or maybe read about some Christians who are so committed and faithful to God and you wondered, how do they do it? I wish I can be like that. I believe it's because they have the right understanding and personal experience of God's forgiveness and grace. Many people are confused or misunderstand salvation, sin, and grace, and those who struggle to commit to be faithful to God and committed to God, I believe, maybe live in three different ways. Some live in extreme guilt of sin. Martin Luther, he was a theologian, a priest, and the father of the Reformation, was one such person. He was disciplined in prayer, he read scriptures, he was doing good works, trying to deserve God's favour and to please God. But he was so conscious and anxious of his sin and desperate for acceptance with God. And he said, I lost touch with Christ the Saviour and Comforter and made him the jailer and hangman of my poor soul. Now, some live with total disregard of sin. Another theologian, a preacher and a bishop, St. Augustine was initially one such person. He rejected his Christian upbringing, choosing to live a life of constant partying. And he fathered an illegitimate child with a young girl, but later abandoned her at the chance of marrying a rich heiress. He once prayed, grant me chastity, but not just yet. These are two extreme ends, and then there are the strugglers in between, and I suspect this might be where mm, some of us are. So what is the truth about sin, salvation, grace, and how do we navigate all that in our relationship with God? I hope that we can find some clarity as we look at Nehemiah chapter 9 and other scripture texts today that will help us as Christians and us as a TPMC community to choose to commit to God. Two weeks ago, Pastor Ben taught us from Nehemiah chapter nine, uh, chapter eight, where the walls of Jerusalem have been built. You know, they have come together to listen to the reading of the law. They learned from the Levites. They understood the teaching from the Levites, and then they acted upon the instructions from the law. And from the law, they learned about the Feast of the Booths, which was learning to trust and depend on God. Today, we will look at chapter 9, where it seems like a very, 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 very long prayer, very detailed. And it sounds like, it almost sounds like it's recounting the whole history of Israel, from the time God called Abraham, to their slavery, to their deliverance from Egypt, to Moses leading them out of the promised land, how they rejected God's prophets, their disobedience and rejection of God leading to their exile. All that in a prayer. In other words, this long, detailed prayer seems like, it's almost like a summary of the entire Old Testament. Is that really a prayer? Are the Levites really praying or are they just trying to tell a story? Or maybe, you know, hmm, they're sneakily trying to preach to people in disguise of a prayer. Now, if we analyze this prayer, which takes up almost the entire chapter, we will learn and see that it is a heartfelt, genuinely sorrowful prayer about their sin and their praise and their gratitude of God's grace over their lives. And from this prayer, I hope that we will be able to see that a wide vision of God revives deep commitment to Him. So first, let's set the context and understand what's happening here at the start of the chapter. On the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. 
and the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of that, of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. So basically, the first three verses of chapter 9 kind of summarizes what's going to happen for the entire rest of the chapter. The rest of all the verses of this chapter are the prayers of the Levites on behalf of the people. And the prayer is segmented into praise, confess, and then commit. So we're going to look at that. From verses 5 to 15, the Levites, the Levite priests praise God for who he is and what he has done. And I think we today, we can praise God with these same verses too. So let's read these verses together as a praise declaration to the Lord. You will see text in blue. I will read the ones in black. You can read the ones in blue. And if you see red text, we will read that together. Shall we? Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone, you made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. And together, you found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. Amen indeed. In their prayer, they praise God as the only true God. He is the creator. He preserves and sustains creation. He is a promise maker. He is a promise keeper. And then from the verses 9 to 15, they continue to praise God and they acknowledge God that God heard their cries and delivered them from slavery in Egypt. God performed signs and wonders by dividing the Red Sea so that they could walk through it and led them by day with a pillar of cloud and by night a pillar of fire to show them which way to go. He gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and he brought water out from a rock for their thirst. In other words, as they praised God, they were describing Him as a deliverer, a miracle worker, a trusted provider. Now, God is not an egoistical, insecure person who needs to hear praise. Yes, come on, tell me more, tell me more of how good I am. No, He's not like that. But He deserves our praise. He is worthy of our praise because of all this and so much more. But I also believe that when we praise God, it encourages us because we start to know Him better. We reflect on the past and we when we remember what God has done for us, when we meditate on scripture of His faithfulness through generations, when we pray by praising the Lord, we begin to get a clearer picture of who God is, His character, His works, His creativity, his holiness, his greatness. We don't box God in based on our own limited knowledge of him. And instead, we get a wider vision of who God is. And that wider vision of God revives a deep commitment to him. Then we come to the confession part. Um, of the prayer of the Levites. And the confession is the main section and majority of their prayer. So I'm going to read quite a lot of verses from this section because I want to make a point about something and I hope that as we go along, you see a pattern. From verses 16 to 37, they confess the sins of their ancestors and their own sin. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. Here they confessed that they were stubborn, 
They rejected God's appointed leader, which was basically rejecting God himself. After the, they confessed their sins, they acknowledged God's grace towards them. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. What else? You, in your great mercy, did not forsake them in the wilderness. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manner from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. You multiplied their children as stars of heaven and you brought them into the land that you told their fathers to enter and possess. That was their confession of God's re response. Now wait, hold on a minute. God's reaction and response doesn't add up, doesn't it? The people confessed and showed that they were disobedient, they rebelled, they rejected God, and God does what? He does not forsake them. He guides them safely through the desert. He provides them with food and water so that they don't need to work. For such that 40 years, they lack nothing. He blessed them with children and gave them land? Doesn't make sense. But the prayer continues with more confession. Oh my, the shame and the embarrassment of their sin. Despite being blessed, they were disobedient and continued to rebel against God. They murdered God's prophets sent to warn them. They continued to do evil. They did not obey God's laws and commandments. Now hear again what they confess about God's response to Israel. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Are we done yet? Is the prayer finished? No, not just yet. After confessing the sins of their ancestors, they also acknowledged their own sins. It wasn't a case of blaming their forefathers. They knew that they were no different from their forefathers in being stubborn and rebellious. And they took personal accountability to confess that we have acted wickedly. Then again, they admitted God's actions towards them. Yet, you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully. Church, do you start to see a pattern here? Despite all the good that God has done for Israel and all the good that He is, Israel doubted, rejected, rebelled against God, and did evil. In their prayer, they confessed their repeated sin, but they also confessed something else, the repeated grace of God, the grace that God had for them. And as they confessed their sin, their vision of God's grace widened even more. Now, we have the privilege of looking into Scripture to see the history of the repeated sin of mankind and our eyes just widen in disbelief at how merciful and patient God is. Confession of sin is important. A healthy and honest reflection of our motives, our attitudes, our words, our actions reveals sin in our lives. And when we come humbly, in humility to acknowledge and confess that to God, we get a wider understanding and appreciation of the length of God's grace and forgiveness towards us. Now, as the Israelites praised God and confessed their sin, their understanding and vision of God grew, and that is what compelled them to fully commit to God. In verse 38, it starts with, because of all this, now, what is all this? It is their repeated sin and God's repeated grace. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, our priests. Confirm, double confirm in writing, sealed with their names, their commitment to God. Now, we can't conjure up commitment to God by our own sure will and determination. Commitment to God is a response when we realize how far we've missed the mark from a holy and a perfect God. 
And yet our hearts are emboldened and strengthened as we meditate on the Word of God. We observe His goodness, His grace. Do you want spiritual revival in your life? Then widen your vision of God. Now, I've heard some people say, don't preach and focus on sin. Preach and focus on grace. Yes, while I do agree that the grace of God is very important, a very important message to tell, we shouldn't discount the severity of sin either. I wonder if we know and we realize the magnitude and the impact of the gospel for humanity and for you. The gospel being the death and the resurrection of Jesus for you. What might be some modern day attitudes towards sin and the gospel? Some people totally reject the severity of sin and the gospel. I didn't ask him to die for me, what? I'm a good person. I don't need him to die for me. People who see God this way don't realize the severity of sin and its impact on our current life and the judgment that is to come after death. Some are hesitant or guilt-ridden. Mm, Jesus' death is an event that happened so long ago, it doesn't feel very personal for me. I don't think God can forgive me. I'm not good enough. People who see God this way don't realize how wide God's love and grace is. Slow to anger, abounding in love. If we have a, a narrow or a small vision of God, God looks so limited to us and we are fearful of giving our whole life and commitment to God. Our small and limited view of God results in small and limited faith in God. But one person I think we can learn from is the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus and his life was never the same. He was totally committed to Jesus Christ and the gospel message and he understood the grace and the love that God poured out for him and for us. He says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Do you want to be a conqueror over the troubles of this world and within yourself? Do you want spiritual revival for a deeper commitment to God by your asking, how do I have a wider vision of God? Can I suggest that we learn from Nehemiah chapter 9? Pray. Nothing fancy, nothing new. Pray. Pray by praising God and confessing your sin. If prayer widens our vision of God, then how do we pray? Some of us don't know how to pray. Some of us struggle with prayer. Some of us think, ah, I just have pastor pray for us, can already lah, pastor pray very good. Some of us don't like to pray. Today's scripture text shows us clearly and simply to praise God, confess sin, and then respond to commit to God. Can I encourage us to first make praise a daily habit? Start your day not with your mobile phone or your social media um, you know, news feeds and all that. Start your day with prayer, praising God for creation, praying for and thanking God in your commute to, to school, to work, or to the market, or wherever it is, it is you go in the morning. And when you read scripture in your quiet time, focus on the action of God, the initiative of God, the character of God. Use the Psalms as praise to God in prayer. Don't just wait on Sundays during corporate worship to praise God in song. And when we play worship songs at home or at work, don't let the music be like background white noise. Pause, listen to the lyrics, praise God and make that your own praise. 
make praise a daily habit, but can I also then suggest make confession a nightly reflection? I heard from a, a counsellor that one of the reasons why some people can't sleep or struggle with sleep or rested sleep or, you know, have a lot of gastrointestinal problems is because our minds are just on overdrive with anxiety or guilt of, ah, oh, what if, ah, yeah, if only I, I should have, ah, yeah, I shouldn't have, just on overdrive in our head. But we can come to God with confession by reflecting on the events of the day, to be honest with God, if there were any sinful attitudes, words spoken, actions taken, and confess that to Him in prayer. You can even write it down in a journal. And when we, when we offload our sins to God and repent, He will carry you with His grace. Are we like the Israelites in repeated pattern of sin? God, I can't forgive this person for hurting me. Yet, you, Lord, have forgiven me. Help me to forgive this brother and sister as well. Lord, I was impatient with my spouse and I said unkind things and kind words to him. But you, Lord, are so patient with me. Your kindness leads me to repentance. Father God, I made things of this world my idols and I did not love you first. Still, you did not forsake me. I did blank. But you, Lord, blank. Can you fill in your own blanks? The Christian who does not marvel at the grace of God over the sinfulness of himself will only live a life of convenient comfort, religious duty, or pious burnout. It's when we come to understand the graveness of our sin, then we will understand the depth of God's grace. And that is when we are compelled to respond to God's grace in commitment. Still don't know how to start to pray? You know, just start with one sentence of praise to God, one sentence of confession, one sentence to ask God to help you to commit to Him. And when we do this daily, we grow in prayer. Now to help you get started, I've also included in today's bulletin an insert uh, with some scripted prayers from Scripture to praise, to confess, and to commit to Him. Take that home, bring it, use it, uh, and help you get started in prayer. We also have an e-copy from our website that you can download from the TPMC homepage when you can download the bulletin and it is inside as well. What a revival it will be to our individual lives and to our church when every one of us prays. And when we pray, we get a clearer and wider vision of God because a wide vision of God revives that deep commitment to Him. Recently, I went to Gardens by the Bay and there was an art exhibition in the Flower Dome and it was showcasing artwork during the era of uh, Impressionism and it featured mostly artwork from Monet, those of you who know Monet's artwork, the lily, uh, floating lilies. But there's also another style of art called Surrealism. And this style combines the reality with the unexpected. It disregards conventional expectations. And they are like, you know, visual puns. And one such artist is Salvador Dali. Now, most paintings and images of Christ that you see on a cross show the front view and the, um, the face of Jesus. But Dali's painting was slightly different. He painted a piece called Christ of St. John of the Cross. Take a look at this. Do you see why it's different? It's not a typical angle of Christ. And in his painting, there are no wounds on his body, no crown of thorns, no nails on his hands and feet. And you can't see Christ's face. Dali painted this where he saw Christ's crucifixion from God's perspective. Now, I'm not an art expert and I don't know about Impressionism or Surrealism, but when I look at this painting, I see another deep and wide. From the angle of God's perspective, looking down towards humanity, how deep the Father's love for us, for you. If you look at Christ's hands stretched out on the cross, held there, and you can see one arm cast a shadow on the beam 
which makes it look unusually long. How wide his commitment in saving us from our sins. And how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch like me and you his treasure. And because of this, I can't help but respond in commitment to him. Will you too? If you want revival, spiritual revival in your life, then widen your vision of God. It will revive a deep commitment to him. Shall we pray? Father God, we acknowledge that we have been like the Israelites in repeated sin, and yet you have given us repeated grace. And we just gaze upon your patience and your amazing grace for us. Church, let's take some time to fill in the blank for yourself. I blank. What sin have you committed? But you, Lord, blank. How has God shown his repeated grace? Search our hearts, O oh Lord, and reveal to us any sin that we have committed. And Father, even though sin in our life is so severe and grave, Lord, your grace abounds repeatedly for us. And we thank you for that. Help us, O oh Lord, to just praise you and know you more and widen our vision of you, O oh God. And as we see that your grace calls us to come in repentance to you, to come to love you with all our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for calling us by your grace. And today, O oh Lord, if there are some of us who need to recommit ourselves to you, God, we want to do that right now. And we say, Lord, not by our own strength, help us by your grace. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.